Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. It's the weekly comic book review. It's the show where I read a lot of comic books and I let you know what I thought about them. And we always start with the pick of the week. And this week's pick of the week, Doctor Strange 390. This is writer Donny Cates' final issue on the title. And it was an amazing run, at least in my opinion. Damnation, maybe not the strongest run for me, but I love Loki Sorcerer Supreme. And this issue is one of the best yet. It's a great epilogue, a great a great ending to what Donny Cates has been doing, the themes he's been building on, his take on the Sorcerer Supreme. But it's not just a great epilogue to his run. It's a great epilogue on this whole volume of Doctor Strange, beginning with Jason Aaron and Chris Bacalo when they came onto the title. Seriously, this was really, really cool. It's got artwork by Fraser Irving. The artwork is majestic. It's glorious. It's beautiful. It does have a guest star of Spider-Man. Spider-Man does get a lot to do in this issue. Kind of makes a good case for Donny Cates to write a Spider-Man title sometime in the future, but the Spider-Man bits are some of the best parts of this issue. There's a part with Spider-Man and a spider. I'm not going to spoil anything for you, but it's two of the best pages of a comic book that I've read all year long, and Chip Zdarsky helped out with that one. I really love this issue. I thought it was great. It's going to be sad to see Cates leave this issue. I thought that he could have gone on for so much longer. I would have loved to have seen Donny Cates do like a, like I said, a 50 plus issue run on this title, but Fraser Irving, a great artist to go along with this. It's a conversation between Doctor Strange and Zelma, so it does wrap up a lot of stuff that's been built up since the Jason Aaron first issue all the way through the Donny Cases issue um, run. I love this issue. I love this run so far. Damnation, like I said, maybe not my favorite. It would have been great in the middle of a 50-issue run. But alas, this is what we got. Doctor Strange 390 is the pick of the week. Amazing artwork, a great coda to a great run and a great up and coming writer at Marvel Comics. Lots of good stuff in the future from Donny Cates, I predict. Another really good book from Marvel this week, Black Panther number one. I'm a little bit behind on Black Panther. I think Ta-Nehisi Coates has been doing a great job. At first, there was a little bit of hiccups. It seemed like he had to a, had a kind of like get used to writing comic books, but it really started working and flowing. I'm about eight issues behind, but I jumped in on this to see how it would feel to a new reader with a new issue number one, and it was very confusing but it was very engaging and very cool as well. So everything that's confusing about this issue is promised at the end of the issue to be revealed at a later time. So this is basically T'Challa or somebody. Somebody wakes up in, in, in space and there's a Wakandan space empire, right? So this is the Wakandan space empire that was promised in the Marvel Legacy one shot of last year. Here it is. It's a little confusing, but it's a great story with great artwork by Daniel Acuna. A great script by Ta-Nehisi Coates. Really like the dialogue, really like the narration, like the pacing, I like the mystery. I like the unfolding of what's going on. I have some ideas about what is going on in this issue. I personally think this issue is way out into the future. I don't think this is T'Challa. I don't think anything like this. But to me, this is basically the story of the future of Wakanda. And I really, really like it. It's great. It's a big space opera type thing. So if you like space things, if you like Guardians of the Galaxy and Thor Ragnarok, this is like Black Panther meets Guardians of the Galaxy a little bit, but I really liked it. thought it had great artwork, a great script, a great way to just jump into this title. Ta-Nehisi Coates is kind of like, I guess, in the middle of his run. Um, what's come before doesn't matter. You can jump right in with this issue. You'll be just as confused as the rest of us, but I think you'll, you'll enjoy it just as much as the rest of us. The Hunt for Wolverine, another miniseries, uh, Mystery in Madripoor, number one, um, I didn't like this one. I didn't like it at all. It's written by Jim Zub, artwork by Tony Silas, and Felipe um, Sobrario. I, I like the coloring. I, do, I don't like the artwork. I don't like the penciling and the ink. I, don't, I just don't like the line work. It doesn't work for me. I didn't like the story. It was very verbose. It felt long. It felt dragged out. This one was just not good. The thing that worries me about these Hunt for Wolverine books, and I like how... All four of the Hunt for Wolverine books kind of like tackle a different part of Wolverine's history. So Adamantium Agenda was like the new Avengers and Weapon Loss. This is like street level New York type stuff. Mystery and Magipore kind of goes back to those early days of the Wolverine solo series by Chris Claremont. Uh, John Bashima and others, um, where he was Patch, and he went, he was in Magipore, and he was Patch, and that's some of my favorite times in Wolverine comics, like seriously, that's when I really first started reading Wolverine and really appreciating the character, I really liked it a lot, but this just didn't do anything for me, it's got a few nostalgic references and all that kind of jazz, and it's got the X-Men, out of all of these Hunt for Wolverine series, this is the one with the most X-Men, and it's cool because it does involve X-Men that 
that Wolverine had a key part in kind of bringing into the fold, like Jubilee and Shadowcat and Rogue and Psylocke, but it's just not working for me. I'm not, I'm not liking these Hunt for Wolverine books. I really thought some of them were pretty good. What was the one last one? Claws of the Killer was actually pretty good. I like how they tackle these different elements of who Wolverine is, but I just ultimately think that none of this is going to lead to anything. I don't know. Infinity Countdown Dark Hawk number one. Self-admittedly, I'm a huge Dark Hawk fan. Early 90s, that was like my prime time of coming up into the comic book industry. I started reading in the mid to late 80s, but like in the in the early 90s, I was like, it was like, it was, it was I was all in, right? And Dark Hawk debuted back then and it was amazing to me. I loved it. I loved the costume. I love the, the, I just love the whole thing, right? So it's nice to see Dark Hawk back. If you were a fan of that Dark Hawk number 51, that legacy one shot, this basically picks right up from that. So it was like if those Marvel legacy one shots were like pilots and they were like, which one do you guys want? And I said, I prefer Dark Hawk, right? I thought that one's great. Power Pack was good too, but the Dark Hawk one was a really cool setup for the future of Dark Hawk. And this is what it is. It's the exact same writers, I think. Absolutely, I do. Um, but I do like it. It's Chris Sims, Chad Bowers. The artwork is Gang and Yuck Kim. Yuck Kim. And I love the artwork. It's great. First of all, I'm just excited to see Dark Hawk back and have it be Chris. And I just like it. I'm, I'm going to tell you one thing, though. I like this book, and it's probably just because I have a huge attachment to this character. But look at that artwork. It's dynamic. It's fluid. Beautiful coloring. I like the way that they use the powers. It's tied into Infinity Countdown in a very, very loose type way. Seriously. All the Raptors stuff that's been going on in Guardians of the Galaxy, I think that's going to get wrapped up here. No Infinity Stone stuff's going to happen in this book, I don't think. But if you're a Dark Hawk fan, if you like that character if you want to see more of that character this is the book to read it's going to be a four issue series two issues next month and the fourth issue after that it's going to be great i love it i think it's great because i'm a dark hawk fan and i'm excited to see him back in the marvel universe it is loosely tied to the whole infinity wars thing maybe he'll be a big player in infinity wars maybe gary duggan has some plans for him but i think this is just more of like a dark hawk reboot kind of subtly thrown into the banner of Infinity Countdown, but it worked for me. I liked it. Great artwork, great coloring, great script, great characterization. And there are a couple pages where it gets a little wordy, a little exposition-y, but overall, I like it a lot. Invincible Iron Man number 600 is here. We gotta talk about this book because not only is this the final issue of Brian Michael Bendis' Iron Man run, it's the final issue at Marvel Comics for now by Brian Michael Bendis. He'll be back. He'll be back. They always go back. Everybody goes back and forth. That's the way it works. But Invincible Iron Man number 600, Bendis has promised this is kind of like his last saying, his last thesis of Marvel Comics. And to me, like, I kind of get what he's saying because this whole issue is kind of basically the AI Tony telling you what's going on and telling you his thoughts on things. So you can pick up Bendis' voice on what he's saying. This does wrap up a lot of stuff. Overall, I'm going to say that Iron Man 600 is cool and it's good. This is not something you can just jump into. I think big issues like 600s and things like that, yeah, they can wrap up a story, but they should also be an, a, a story where someone can jump in. If you just jumped into here for the first time, you're going to be so confused, so off the wall or whatever. But even if you fell out of Iron Man, I would recommend that you pick this up and read it. It wraps up everything. The whole Tony, his mother, his dad, his re biological mother and dad, right? What's going on with Tony? The search for Tony Stark. What's happened to other characters in the Tony Stark universe? I'm not spoiling anything, but I was very pleased with some things that happened in this. But one thing I really want to point out, uh, touch on is that this does wrap up the final bit that Bendis is doing with the infamous Iron Man with Victor Von Doom going out on this heroic quest to be the new Iron Man and man it's like a, such a great ending and it's so appropriate for that character and it's sad and it's 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 tragic and I really really like it so what what Bendis has been doing with Doom completely just comes to a head here and it's great. What he's been doing with Tony comes to a head here and it's all right. And there's some great setup for some future stuff, but business isn't going to be around for that future stuff. And most of that setup involves Ironheart. The biggest weakness to me in this is that I don't feel like Tony, I mean, I feel like Bendis had his final say on Ironheart. Maybe one that's the character that he's leaving there so that when he comes back to Marvel in like five to ten years, he can pick up what he where he left off with Riri. But there's some interesting things that he leaves dangling there for the next creator teams to come in and do with those characters. Some really intriguing stuff. Don't want to spoil anything in the book. There were things in there that really, really excited me. 
but they were and overall I felt like it was just a lot thrown in and just a really quick wrap up even though it was a very very long issue I just I don't feel like uh, I don't feel like Bendis was ready to let go of what he was doing on Iron Man but the Doom stuff really wraps up in a way that I was very satisfied with and if there's another thing in there that happens I'm very satisfied with we'll talk about that on the live stream this Saturday night this Saturday night there's going to be uh, Robbie Rance live uh, 7 o'clock Central Standard Time US. Old Man Hawkeye number five is here. I'm loving this book. This book, we just were promised that this was going to be kind of like a little prequel to Old Man Logan. We weren't thinking much of it. We knew Marco Cicchetto was going to be on the artwork, so we knew that would be amazing. And it is seriously some great, fantastic, beautiful artwork, great composition, great coloring, all that jazz. But who is Ethan Sachs? What's he going to do with the script? Is it going to be interesting? Is it going to be enthralling? Is it just going to be kind of mediocre? No, it's great. The dialogue is spot on. The pacing is perfect. Everything about this book just hits and fires off on all cylinders appropriately and at the right times. I love it. And this has become more of a love letter to Thunderbolt fans than I ever thought it would be. Seriously, if you're a fan of what Kurt Busiek and Fabian Nicieza was doing on Thunderbolts back in the day, read this book. It's sad. It's tragic. But it's a great like love letter to the Thunderbolts, all eras of the Thunderbolts. Even if you like the Warren Ellis stuff, you get plenty of Bullseye. You got Venom. But you also got Songbird and the Beetle and Atlas. And I'm sure we're going to build up to a big Zemo thing and maybe some Moonstone. So I loved Thunderbolts back in those Busiek and Nicieza days and Bagley and all that jazz. So I am just, I just, I'm loving this book. It's great. It's like, it's like what Old Man Logan was to the X-Men, Old Man Hawkeye is to the Thunderbolts. Does that make sense? Speaking of Old Man Logan, here he is with issue number 40 of his ongoing series. This has been a great replacement for an ongoing Wolverine series. We're going to be getting an ongoing Wolverine series soon, so this is going to... What's going to happen to Old Man Logan? I think they're writing him out. I think he's slowly going away. We shall see. But I like the stuff that Ed Brisson's been doing in this book. This issue is all right. It's a nice wrap-up of this glob story, which is a little cliche, but very touching all at the same time. I like the artwork. The artwork is by Robertson. That is Ibrahim Robertson. Um, I do like the story. I like it. I think Brisson understands the character Wolverine, especially even as Old Man Logan. I, I feel like this book is nearing an end point. <clears throat> I feel like Ed Brisson is being led to be like, you have to wrap up Old Man Logan. You got to wrap up the yesterday's X-Men stuff. Maybe he's going to be the new writer on Uncanny X-Men. Who knows? But Old Man Logan still remains a favorite of mine, even though it's it's the last couple issues have been good, sentimental, cliche, not as good as the stuff that Brisson did before, the Lemire stuff before that. But Old Man Logan is still a very, very solid comic book. And I want to talk about Shield number five here. This is a uh, Shield by Jonathan Hickman and Dustin Weaver, volume two, number five. This is about like what four years later, something, guys. I'm gonna, uh, just gonna let you know I didn't read this because I need to go back and read all my Shield stuff. But I am so pumped. I don't even want to flip through this. But there are reverber reverberations of Jonathan Hickman's Shield even in this Iron Man issue right there. So that's nifty and cool. Um, so I didn't read it, but I'm super pumped to read it. But I definitely got to go back and read everything that led up to this because it's been so long i don't remember where we left off let's go over to dc because justice league no justice number three is out this week i loved it it's great no francis manipul on the artwork a little bit of uh, marcus toe a lot of riley rosemo which is going to throw some people off because the style is like way different but i love his style and i think it really works well on this giant like Justice League epic adventure type book. I thought it worked really well. When you read this book as a trade, the artwork's going to be up and down. It's the only problem I got with it, but I love the stories. I love the big cosmic ideas. This is like a very shortened version of metal. It's like metal got big and epic and like just like what, what a terrible situation that the heroes are in. This did it just amped up and quicker. It's seriously like a, a Cliff Notes version of that type of crisis level event. But this is just a Kickstarter. You can definitely tell by the events that happen in this issue, which are big and major and just like, what? These poor, the poor Justice League. They have no luck. But I love the character interaction. I love these new characters and these new dynamics. I'm so excited for what's coming up with Scott Snyder, James Tinian, and Joshua Williamson on the Justice League titles. It all starts here. This is just the firing shot. And it's the biggest, epic, most cosmic thing since Metal, which was, you know, wrapped up like a month ago. But I like it. I, like I said, I like Rosemont's artwork. I think it's really solid. It's different than what Manipul and Toe do, but I think it's very appropriate. I'd like to see him more on some big, big, epic DC-type stories. There's some great Starro bits in here as well, dude. I'm loving No Justice, loving it. A little sad to talk about this book 
Detective Comics 981. This is the final issue by James Tinney and the Fourth. James, I don't think you watch this video, and that's fine. But I just want to say this to you and to our fans, because you have done such an amazing job on this book. What you have done with the Batman family, what you have done for Batman fans, and that's what I mean by Batman family. I mean the Batman family as in Batwoman and Cassandra and Stephanie and Tim and Clayface now. We welcome Clayface into the Bat family, but all of his fans as well. This has been the best, the best Batman book since Rebirth has started, I love it. Everybody's going crazy about Scott Snyder and Tom King. James Tinney and what you have done on this title has been amazing. And now he's got Eddie Barrows back for the final issue. It wraps up perfectly. It ends perfectly. So just, just thank you so much, guys. Everybody involved with this book, thank you so much. Because I grew up reading Batman in the late 80s, early 90s. But it really started hitting home to me in the late 90s, early 2000s. I love Cassandra Kane. I, I, I loved Azriel. I, I it's just every, thank you guys so much. I can't even talk about it. It's a great ending, but I'm sad to see it go. But seriously, this has been the best Batman book I've read since Greg Rucka. I love that so much. So Tinian, Barrows, um, uh, all everybody who was ever a part of that book, thank you so much for me. Because like seriously, like that book meant so much to me. Another final issue is Super Sons number sixteen, but be rejoicing because we know that it's coming back in August with Adventures of the Super Sons, number one. It's a 12 issue series. Um, this kind of leads into that just a little bit, but it's a nice final run. And that's my cover of the week because I just love that cover so much. And look at it. Look at, look at Damien's. He's got that fade going, man. It looks nice. But it's a great issue. It wraps up some fun stuff. Super Sons has been super fun. That's what I've been saying this entire year. Um, these characters are great. Jonathan Kent, Damien Wayne, characters that could be easily hated and written away. Like a crisis could come and just wipe them away, but I don't want them to because these characters are so amazing and they're so amazing under the guise uh under under, under the guidance of of uh, uh what's his name peter tomasi's uh, uh pencil i love his scripting i love his work with these characters it's amazing really good stuff the Flash is here. Uh, officially, Flash War has kicked off with issue number 47. I read this a few weeks back. Now I get to read it again, all in color, without anything like interrupting it. And it's a great kickoff to this thing. If you've been reading what's going on in Flash right now, Williamson's kind of taken, like kind of what Tinian did with Detective Comics, where he took some of the old school pre-New 52 bits that got forgotten about and brought them back in. That's what's happening in Flash. So if you've been really eagerly anticipating Wally West to get, like, get his memories back and things like that to start kind of progressing forward, it seems like it's gone to right here. You got Howard Porter on here doing some artwork. It's really cool. It's good stuff. Um, it's a little inconsistent and shaky at times, but there's one moment in particular I want to talk about where he throws a little flashback right there to the Grant Morrison JLA that he was the penciler on, and dude, it's just nice throwback. But he's a great art uh, artist for The Flash. It's very energetic and dynamic when it needs to be. Look at stuff like that. But this is very interesting. If you're a Flash fan, if you're a Zoom fan, a Reverse Flash fan, read this, read this. Flash War is going to be huge and big, right? So Terrifics number four is here, and I'm just going to say this is the issue I've been waiting for. Doc Chenier on the artwork, the perfect artist for this book. I, I'm so, I, used to, I thought that he was going to be the artist on this book. Severely disappointed to know that he's not because his artwork on this title is fantastic it's terrific it's amazing there's the first page right there this is a great story it's the best issue yet in my opinion it's this is basically the fantastic four all the characterization is right there the the character dynamics are right there the way they talk to each other the way they exist but they're very intriguing characters mr terrific is very much like mr Ter uh, fantastic but it works very well and i like it and doctioneer on the artwork just really makes this a great title and we forget sometimes i forget that tom strong is just right around the corner the terrifics is a great book i know i I may have been down on it the last couple issues saying like I don't get what's going on with this book I get what's going on with this book right now I gotta let go that Shanir's not going to be the ongoing artist neither is Ivan Reyes but this book is Jeff Lemire doing what he does best when he reflects on old school superhero superheroics like he does over at Black Hammer the terrifics is really fun this was my favorite issue yet I found this to just be an absolute blast to read. Mira Queen of Atlantis number four is here with her best issue of her series yet. I really like this. I thought it finally got into some decent characterization. 
M not just for Mira, but mostly for Orm, for the Ocean Master. I really like what Dan Adams doing here with the Ocean Master, kind of setting some things up alongside the Aquaman book to, to trailblaze into the future. But it's nice to see Mira get the spotlight. But I did enjoy this issue. I like the artwork by Lan Matina. I thought this was the best issue of the series yet. That's what I thought. Let's move over to some independent and other publishers, right? Delta 13 from IDW this is number one. I read this because uh, Steve Niles and Nat Jones. I like the artwork. It's creepy. Steve Niles does horror pretty decent, but this doesn't feel just, it just doesn't feel complete. It doesn't feel like a good solid first issue. It does leave you on a little bit of a nice cliffhanger, but it, I feel like this one should have kind of gone further into the story to really hook us in. But the basic gist of it is these, these people are out in space and they come across this random asteroid and it's not marked. They don't know what it is. There's nothing that should be there. And then they, they, they realize that it's kind of like cavernous and so they go inside of it and then they start reading these like, <clears throat> they get these strange readings on their scientific equipment. And that's pretty much the whole first issue. That's pretty much the whole first issue. To me, that's like the first like flow of the first issue, but oh well. I just feel like they kind of like, they're, they're like building it up, I don't know, it's just, it just didn't have a good pull for me because I felt like they didn't go far enough into the story to really hook me in. Skyward number two, though, was amazing. Better than issue one. Issue one was great. It was very light. It was brisk. It was free. But it's basically about a world where gravity stopped working. And what happens to the world like 20, 30, whatever years later, right? Well, issue two really takes the world building to a next level, right? It really takes it to the next plane. And I really thought it did great. It did great at building the world. Like, seriously, it sounds silly. Like, gravity stops working. But it would be like a really tragic event for humanity and we would really have to like adapt to do it well the way that the writers have thought about the way it would adapt joe henderson is the writer lee garib and antonio fabella are the artists uh simon boland the color of rick lopez jr the artist love it look that kind of tragic stuff would happen if gravity just stopped working and now we live in a brave new world where people can just float away right but the world building really gets amped up in issue two the characterization gets amped up in issue two I'm hooked. Issue one I thought was alright. I was like, you know, it's good, it's a nice premise, it's cool, but the comic book is just very fast and just kind of, it's just kind of free and kind of forgettable, right? Except for the, like, the premise. But issue two, nah, totally sold. This book is awesome from Image Comics. Check it out. My low G life, that's right. Also from Image Comics, we got Barrier number four, the fourth part of a five-part miniseries. It's going to be weekly. It's been releasing ever since uh, Free Comic Book Day. It was digital first. Brian K. Vaughn, Marcos Martin. Marcos Martin is an expert at sequential storytelling, and that is the whole point of this issue. You don't need, like, half of this issue is in Spanish. I don't read Spanish. I don't read Spanish. Half of this whole series has been in Spanish. I don't read Spanish, but I understand the story. I get the flow of it. Look at that crazy, cool, psychedelic alien stuff. Really cool, very poignant, very simple, but very effective. I like it a lot. Elsewhere is here from Jay Farber with issue number seven. I love Elsewhere so much. He's doing such a great job, seriously. I want to point out, though, the artist. Um, Sumei Kesgen and Ron Riley as the coloring, and Thomas Maurer as the letterer and designer, because let's not forget those guys, because they do an, like, an amazing job of making the books actually accessible and easy to get through or whatever. But I love the art in here, man. The coloring is great. The line work is great. The story is great. The script is crisp. It's, 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 it's got a great pace to it. I love it. It's basically the story of where Amelia Earhart wound up. So she, she, you know, Amelia Earhart went off on her voyage and she disappeared. And, you know, recently we, we may have found her body and all that stuff. But for a long time, we were always like, what happened to her? Well, she went off through a portal to this other dimension, this other world, this like fantasy place. She found D.B. Cooper. She had crazy mad adventures. That's what this is elsewhere. And it's awesome. You should totally check it out. Days of Hate is here with number five out of the five out of 12. It's going to be a 12-issue miniseries. This is great. Alesh Kott doing a fantastic job. Um, I just really want to point out the artist, and I always mess up this cat's name. Seriously. Um, Dangel Sajelj. I'm messing that up so much, but I just want to point this guy out. I love his artwork. I love his artwork so much. I know a lot of people look at it, they don't like it. It's striking. It's graphic. And look at those colors. Those colors by Jordi Belair. I was just talking to a colorist. I'm not going to say who, but they were basically telling me that Jordi Belair, you can tell when she's really into a, a subject, when she's really into a project, because sometimes it just looks like she's just like kind of like laying down flat. She's not putting much effort into it, but the choices are there and everything still works and it pops and it's great, right? But it's not as good as some of her other work, but this is, this is that work. This is that work. Look at those colors right there. Jordi Belair, this is some of her best artwork. I, I just, I love it. All 
all around. I love this book so much. I think it's absolutely amazing. It's a little scary. It's a little dark. It's a little, it's a little dour. This is not a book that's going to uplift you. But this is, a, this is the kind of dark story that you can take and uplift yourself with. Let's not get to this point, right? But Days of Hate, I love that book so much. And finally, let's talk about from Aftershock and Cullen Bunn, Brothers Dracul, with artwork by Mirko Kolak. I really want to spotlight Kolak's artwork because look at that. And the coloring, the coloring is beautiful and it's got texture and it's gritty and it's just amazing. Like the coloring is bold and textured and just, it's it's just really really something special to me i really in this issue was really stricken by the coloring right the story's gotten a lot better from issue one i thought issue one was a decent setup i'm a huge dracula fan so i picked up issue two i like where we're going i get where we're going i like it but seriously i'm gonna keep reading this book because that coloring man i'm gonna show you a page that coloring that coloring. I'm just losing my mind on the coloring in comics this week. Seriously, Days of Hate, Brothers Drag Cool, some of the best coloring out there elsewhere. Barriers, Skyward, fantastic artwork is just making comic books amazing. So that's what I read this week, and that's what I thought about it. Like I said, pick of the week was da -da 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 -da, Doctor Strange, speaking of fantastic artwork and coloring, Fraser Irving right there. Good stuff. Skyward was great, though. Don't sleep on that one. Issue 2 was even better than Issue 1. Iron Man 600 it was a nice celebration. And some really neat stuff happened that it pleased me. Black Panther number one was very enjoyable. And No Justice was fantastic. And I'm very sad to see Tinian go. Almost lost a ping pong ball. Anyway, thank you guys so much for checking out the video. I'm sorry it was a little bit late, but I watched Perfect Circle last night. It was an amazing show. It was great. We had a great time. Tonight, get to go see Kevin Smith. It's been a very exciting week. So thank you guys so much for rocking with us. And keep on reading. Check us out at popculturephilosophers.com for podcast blogs, top five lists, and a whole lot more. Thanks for rocking with us.